Hello and welcome to the Somerville News Roundup with the Somerville Journal. I'm Jane Regan, the coordinator of Somerville Neighborhood News. Julia, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for um, having me, Jane. It's been a pretty busy couple of weeks out there. <laughs> sure has. <laughs> so um, what can our readers and viewers find in the recent issue or maybe past two issues of Somerville Journal or what's coming up? Sure. So I think the first thing I wanted to touch on um, was the issues around traffic calming, especially in the wake of some of the tragedies and injuries that we've been seeing, especially along the Mystic, um, Mystic Avenue and McGrath Highway mm -hmm. in East Somerville. Right. I know there was a public hearing or maybe there yeah. were two meetings. I there know been the some senator was involved. Correct. There were several community meetings um, where the city came and actually representatives from the state as well, so from the Mass Department of Transportation, to mm -hmm. talk to constituents and residents about what they're doing in the wake of these tragedies. And a lot of these kind of updates are focused on the intersections where those two um, people were killed, but it's also where the other two people were injured. Um, which is, like I said, along Mystic and McGrath. Um, but I think what I wanted to talk about was that residents are still, you know, even with these updates coming down the line, um, residents are still really concerned. Um, so last week I actually went out and met with a woman named Melissa um, who lives in the Ten Hills neighborhood, um, kind of right along um, McGrath. And she walked me around. Um, which was really, really interesting to see. I kind of met her early in the morning and walked um, with her and her daughter to school, the route they take. And, um, you know, when we were at that intersection of Temple Road and Mystic, I stood there for half an hour and watched, you know, as, as cars blocked the intersection and ran through red lights, sped up at yellow lights, and then got stuck in the crosswalk and, you know, watched the, you know, the crossing guard <laughs> risk her life several times yeah. in that half an hour. And, you know, what was interesting is technically it was a Jewish holiday and they kept on joking about how this was actually a good day, a slow day. Oh, because maybe some people were Exactly. Out. And they said usually the cars are like way backed up into the Ten Hills and way down Broadway and that, you know, that whole thing coming down from Broadway. And, um, it, you know, it really showed me that this, this is an ongoing issue and that even though, you know, light signal timing changes could really help, some new paint and more visibility could really help. Um, that these residents are looking for some pretty substantive changes. Now, is the bus lane, is there a bus lane at that intersection also? Because I know this is also a new, probably adding some frustration. Mm. It's a new uh, part of the traffic um, sure. orientation on Broadway. And so I think I've actually seen some drivers have been writing letters uh, mm -hmm. to a different a newspaper yes. uh, <laughs> complaining about the bus lane. Um, I think the bus lanes are great myself. Sure. I live in Cambridge where they really work. But is that adding to the problem? Sure. So I think, or is that part of the solution? Right. This this issue in particular, um, I know that Melissa herself, she's really in support of the bus lane, and she is not she is not convinced that the bus lane on Broadway has really much of anything to do with the congestion on Mystic. Right. That's her perspective. Um, I think to a degree, it, it may back up the traffic a little bit into that intersection and into several others along that road um, on Mystic. But we're we're definitely following that. Um, I think. You know, what I observed at the community meeting when it comes to those, those bus lanes, you know, some people are, some people want them removed. Um, but a lot of people, like you, are in support of them. They, they want the infrastructure to begin happening around this kind of transit. Right. But what they're disappointed in is the, com the like, communication from the city. They didn't feel like there was adequate communication about when they were going up, how residents were going to be impacted, you know, where traffic was going to be redirected because of, um, you know, ways and Google Maps and all of the people yeah. things used to get around. So what other streets might become congested, they are just, they're dealing with it. And I think right now, because of all the construction going on in the city, it's tough to get around. And yeah. even though a lot of people are like, yes, we want this bus lane, this is so cool, they're also dealing with the congestion now. So they, they wish, I think, there would be a little bit more communication from the city. That's what I'm seeing. So to go back to the traffic issue, mm. to finish up on that, sure. do you think that communicate more communication is needed? Do you think that we need to have more enforcement at some of these um, intersections, enforcement of both pedestrian, I mean, I could say bikers and drivers mm -hmm. and even pedestrians who zoom across, um, you know, who when it says don't walk and then they walk and then yeah, they complain right. about, you know, <laughs> sure. I mean, what do you think from your perspective, having walked around and gone to these meetings, if you were the mayor or the head of the, you know, traffic and parking, what would you do? I, you know, I think the city has it right to a degree that this is going to take 
kind of a, <laughs> a whole bunch of approaches because Enforcement alone is not going to work. It's, it's shown that, you know, if a police officer stands somewhere and gives a bunch of people tickets who run the red light, that usually after that officer leaves, behavior tends to change for a week or two, mm -hmm. and then it goes right back to the way it was. Mm -hmm. So enforcement alone isn't going to do it. So I think light signal timing is a big thing. So for example, there's a blinking yellow at the intersection where it really doesn't make sense to have a blinking yellow because cars kind of pile up into the intersection. Yes. And then as soon as it turns red, they all go, meaning that other people can't come this way. And then if that street is blocked, you know, it, it can create. So changes like that will have an impact on safety. But I think, you know, what, what people started talking about at the community meeting and what is not, not an easy solution and not something simple um, or something you can just, you know, paint on a road is um, civility, is how do all of us who are navigating this crazy, congested, trafficy world um, of Boston and Somerville, right. um, how do we try to remember, even as we're in a hurry and trying to get somewhere on time, which I know is you know more dire for some of us than others, that we have to respect you know each other's lives, <laughs> literally lives. Um, it's you know it's not an easy. Um, it's not an easy thing to think about, especially when you have been sitting in traffic for an hour and a half and you're five minutes late for work already. Um, but I think it's something that's worth talking about. Is, you know, how do we get some civility back <laughs> onto our streets? <laughs> well, I, I'm sure that um, the work that you do at the Somerville Journal is, is part of the answer. for so. communicating and, uh, <laughs> and covering things, which is great. Um, I, want to, I don't want to take up all our time mm -hmm. on various neighborhoods, but uh, sure. let's quickly uh, catch up on what's happening with the Davis Square redesign. Yeah. And yep. um, is that all set in stone or literally <laughs> and figuratively? Sure. Um, yes, what's, yeah, what's so, the latest? So I think not even a little is the, the answer to that. Um, so we, they had a meeting um, of the planning board where the city presented the Davis Square neighborhood plan to the planning board officially. Um, and they are still accepting comment. They're going to be accepting comment through November 1st. Um, which is a Friday, and so we are not even close to being done. There's tons of public comment around, you know, density, around building height, around um, public open space. Um, there are conversations around bus lanes, around bike lanes, around closing streets to pedestrian access only. There is a ton of stuff packed into that plan. Um, really fascinating to read, frankly. And a lot of work and activism has gone into the plan as it exists today. But I, I think based on the amount of public comment that was offered at that hearing that there's going to be a lot more work and activism that goes and into the not, final one. It's not going to get approved on November 2nd. <laughs> no, I don't think so. So if somebody uh, watching this is interested in um, learning more, they can obviously read uh, yep. a story that you did in the Somerville Journal. But also, where else can they go on the city website? And also, where would they file a comment? Sure. So they can go um, find the planning board on somerville.gov. Um, and they can file a comment there. They can find the plan there, um, as well as on the OSPCD website. There are all the neighborhood plans, and we have also linked it in our article. So there's many ways you can go and read about it. <laughs> Great, thanks. Yeah. Um, there were there uh, was a candidate forum. So mm -hmm. um, I think it was a weekend or two ago. Can you talk a little bit about that and about upcoming elections? I don't think it's too early to remind people that Never. they've got to make sure they've registered mm -hmm. and are going to vote. I know I happen to live in Cambridge. I know that's a sin. But uh, <laughs> in Cambridge, you can register. I think today is the last day you can register. So I'm not sure what the last day is here. But mm -hmm. yeah, talk to us about elections and the candidate forum. Sure, yes. Yeah. So October 16th is actually the last day you can register to vote okay. municipal elections in Somerville. Um, but yes, um, a couple weeks ago or a week and a half ago, we had um, the, climate, the candidate climate forum um, or climate candidate forum um, for Somerville candidates, we invited um, the mayoral candidates as well as all of the city councilors, including the ones who are running unopposed, because all of the ward councilors are running unopposed. Um, and we had a pretty good turnout. Um, I worked with Renee Scott and Larry Yu. I was the moderator for the event, oh, which great. was a very new and very cool experience for me, um, having to tell people to shh all the time. Um, it was really cool. Um, and I certainly learned a lot. But I think what was great is that um, the, the room was packed. Um, and what it really showed is that, you know, the, the city is invested in, in climate and environmental issues as a candidate issue. Mm -hmm. um, and they want to see action. Um, but the really cool thing, um, you know, at least for, you know, not every candidate was there, um, was that every candidate that was there, you know, no one 
is denying climate change. No one is working against this kind of activism. Everyone agrees that action needs to be taken, right. which was pretty cool to see. And then it was just a matter of kind of their different strategies and different approaches and what they're prioritizing okay. around seeing that. So, you know, some people spoke more about infrastructure. So prioritizing green transit, like bikes, like bus lanes, things like that. Some people talked more about, you know, sustainable development. So making sure that all of our new buildings are, you know, passive house standard or energy efficient or no gas. Um, so that you know, we're not having to retrofit buildings, yeah. which really won't work. If our goal is to be um, carbon neutral by 2050, which is what the cli Somerville Climate Forward Plan alleges or yes. wants, uh -huh. um, we can't, according to them, we can't be like retrofitting all these buildings, the new ones that we're building, all new stuff being built all has to. to be like this. Um, so it was, there were tons more things talked about, um, but it was a really, it was a really interesting forum. Um, and yes, so the election is on November 5th. Um, which is really cool. And one thing I'll say is, you know, I've been doing some research around um, municipal election turnout, yes. um, which is historically a lot lower mm -hmm. than turnout in federal elections and state elections. Mm -hmm. um, but in 2017, Somerville had a, a record turnout of about 30%. I saw that. Um, which is, it's very, very high regionally as well, very high yeah. um, for elections, for municipal elections. So I would challenge the Somerville community, what if we could break it? Yeah. So I think Mark that's November fifth. Maybe and maybe uh, we should keep an eye on that. Maybe they, maybe you can write an article for a national publication. Mm. <laughs> um, oh, speaking of articles, before we finish up, um, some reporting that you did a while back may have contributed to some changes mm. that um, folks might have noticed uh, in the Animal Control Office. Sure. Well, I, I can't necessarily allege that my reporting had an impact. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, back in January, um, an organization, the Charles River Alley Cats, um, sent some complaints to the city um, regarding uh, an animal control officer, Michael Lapiana, um, about his conduct while he was on the job. Um, it alleged, you know, certain, um, you know, instances of animal cruelty and neglect. Um, and then kind of after, about two weeks after uh, the city received these complaints, the mayor or the administration officially moved for his reappointment. So the way it works is that um, all appointed positions of which the animal control officers are included have to come before the city council for reappointment every year. Mm -hmm. um, it's standard. Right. Um, but when I kind of heard about this, because the organization reached out to me, um, I was a little confused because it had been several weeks after, and I, I thought, you know, maybe they would be investigating or possibly looking into these complaints before moving for his reappointment. Of course, that's my own assumption. Mm -hmm. um, but when I, you know, when I reported on that, um, it was, you know, a little bit convoluted because around that time they moved for his reappointment, but then said they needed some time. And then they ended up withdrawing both Lapiana's name as well as Rachel Taylor's name, who is the other animal control officer, not from positions, but from before the city council so that the city council could not deliberate on their appointments. I see. Um, so it's kind of just been in limbo, mm -hmm. um, but I, I was aware that um, uh, Michael Labiano was up for his recertification, um, his state recertification this year, um, which he did attend and did um, pass, um, but he was um, let, not let go, he no longer works for the city of Somerville as of July 18th. Okay. Um, so, and because it's a personnel issue, the city cannot, will not confirm whether an investigation took place. They simply say that, you know, any and all complaints received by the city are looked into in this fashion. So that's kind of the personnel policy of the city. Right. Um, so that's all we really know. That's all we really know. Uh, but mm -hmm. it also, I think, is um, you know, a testament to journalism and also to people. You know, that sure. thing they say on the subway in New York, if you see something, say something. Sure. And that applies to everything. It does. Um, now, this weekend, this, uh, quite recently, you had your first experience at a Somerville annual event. Yes, I am a recent transplant to the area, also a Cambridge resident, so, <laughs> whoops. Um, but I, I'm lucky enough to live in the Davis Square area, so I, I mean, I couldn't really avoid it. Um, but honk happened, and I was so excited to go for, my, for the first time ever. Um, I went to the welcoming ceremony on Saturday uh, to cover it, and even though it was drizzly, um, it was also loud and colorful and so magical. And I was just so excited to even just be observing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, um, a, I think that was the 13th or the yeah. 19th or it's in the teens. It's a, who knows? <laughs> well, it was actually, really cool I event. was there on a, the, the day of the parade, Sunday, mm, Sunday, 
with um, one of the new reporters for Somerville Neighborhood News. I think I've told you and I've told a lot of folks in the city we're trying to get Somerville Neighborhood News started up again. Um, I was the founder of it in 2013 and with the help of the staff here and, and support of the board and two great student reporters um, we're trying to do some coverage. So uh, she did a great uh, reporting on the social justice mm. orientation mm. of the activism and so we can look forward to that story soon. In fact, I'll make sure the Somerville Journal gets a copy of it. Amazing. And, uh, we'll link to it from this um, from this report here. It should be ready uh, pretty soon. Lovely. Um, and then I guess to talk about another news related yes. event, mm -hmm. um, I know that you're part of a volunteer group that I also participate mm -hmm. in. Can you tell us about an event that's coming up on November 2nd? Sure. So people may remember that we had an event in the spring. Was yeah, it that long February ago? February-ish, yeah. yeah. Um, where we kind of, you know, ask the community, you know, what what do you want from your news? What news aren't you seeing? Um, and you know, we had a lot of people come out on that dreary Saturday morning to one Somerville, um, and you know, let us know what they want to be seeing more of, you know, in this community. However, the thing that you know is the reality that we're working with is that you know, I. I am just me at the Somerville Journal. Yeah. You know, I, I can't, I can't do it all. No matter, no matter how many people may tell me what's going on, well-intentioned, engaged people. You know, there's nothing wrong with them. Um, I can't get to everything. Right. So um, this group of people, we're calling ourselves the Somerville News Garden. Right. And right. that's some people might not get the reference, but sure. that's to juxtapose it with this mm -hmm. idea of news deserts, mm -hmm. which are happening, which exist all over the country, and right. it's where they're is not enough local journalism going on Precisely. to give communities the news and information they need to actually take part in a, their democratic communities, right? Exactly. So it's the news garden. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. Right. So, and some people, you know, I remember when I brought this up, some people were like, wow, Somerville isn't a news desert. Like, that makes no sense. You know what I mean? Like, we have this newspaper and that newspaper, and we're in the metro area, so we get some coverage from Boston. And I was like, well, Maybe. you know, <laughs> yes, that's true about, about larger issues, you know, about, you know, maybe... You know, people were impressed that we were the first East Coast city to ban the use of face surveillance technology. Like, that got some more regional coverage. Right. But what about the minutia? What about everything else? What about our police department? You know, our animal control offices? You know, who, you know, I about can't... About the meetings you go about to. About the meetings, you know, and I can't go to every city council meeting because I have a life. Yeah. <laughs> I can't go to every one. But that used to be the standard. People used to be watching. Right. You know what I mean? So that's kind of the, the juxtaposition that we're talking about. So anyways this event on November 2nd. Um, real news, fake news, no news, right? Yeah, that's okay. the name, and yeah. <laughs> I'm participating in it also. So, um, yeah, the idea is to take this, this movement one step further, mm -hmm. to get folks to come and um, learn a little bit more about the desertification and the gardening, um, yes. the, the gardening efforts, and then actually um, to do some citizen journalism mm -hmm. work right there at that meeting, and then we'll have some spin-off workshops right yes. here at the Somerville Media Center, um, and they'll be free and everything. And the idea is to try to get what they call citizen journalists, mm -hmm. um, although I like to call them community journalists, because some of our great people who live here in the city might not be U.S. citizens, mm. but they're residents, right? Mm. So I call them community journalists, but getting folks to help um, to create to do their own uh, journalism under the guidance or in, in conjunction with folks like you, yeah. like Some Real Neighborhood News. The mm -hmm. idea is to get more of us out there covering more things so that all of us can help create um, a more informed uh, community. We already have a vibrant community. We just uh, should have a more yeah. informed community. Mm, um, agreed. So yeah, so uh, that's on November 2nd. It's uh, at noon, and it's also at Once Somerville. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll make sure to link to it. Um, so Julia Taliesin, right? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for joining me here today. I'm Jane Regan, uh, the coordinator of Somerville Neighborhood News here at Somerville Media Center. Um, and we want to thank everybody here at the center for helping us make this recording possible. See you soon. See ya.